Coming up on this week's show, Heidi Cullinan and Iggy Tomer are here to talk about their collaboration on the Roosevelt series. Plus, Christina has some book recommendations. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knaus. Welcome, everyone, to episode 119 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from JeffAdamsWrites.com. And I'm Will from WillKanaus.com. This week's episode is brought to you in part by listeners just like you. We will have more information on how you can help support this show in just a few moments. Welcome, everyone, to a, another episode and another week of the show. Welcome to you, sir. And welcome to you. It is a very big week. It is. Why is it a big week? Because it is the official release week of The Hockey Player's Heart. Yay! Yay, we're finally here. <laughs> we're finally here. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Uh, it's It's been a good week. Uh, I've enjoyed getting our promotional stuff out and talking to you on Facebook mm-hmm. about the book. Uh, it does officially come out on Tuesday. It is currently on sale for 25% off at Dream Spinner Press. There's a great sale actually happening over there. The whole store is on sale. Mm-hmm. through uh, January 17th, so it's a great time to go pick up our book if you'd like, or pick up any number of things from uh, some great authors. Yeah, lots of great books for sale at dreamspinnerpress.com. Also, uh, Hockey Player's Heart is, of course, available at ev- everywhere, uh, all all where all fine... Re- Online books are sold. Gosh. That's okay. <laughs> we I'm got too excited. Sale. I don't have words. I'm too too damn excited. We also got the word this week that it uh, is headed to audio, mm-hmm. which we knew it would be because all the dream spuns are go, go to audio. But it looks like we'll be out in audio uh, in the springtime, uh, March April time frame, which is exciting. The blog tour, of course, is happening. So there's about a dozen places you'll be able to go and register for the chance to win uh, either an ebook or if you're the grand prize winner and you're in the U.S., you'll get a signed paperback from us. Or if you're international, a $10 Amazon e-gift card. Very exciting stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Links to all of it are happening in the show notes. Yes. Fantastic. Would you like to welcome our new patron? I would indeed. Welcome, TJ, to our Patreon family. Hello, TJ. We are glad you are here. Uh, you can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For as little as $0.25 cents an episode, that is just $1.00. One silver dollar a month, you can uh, help uh, pay the cost of producing and distributing this podcast. And for fans who pledge at the silver and gold levels, you'll have the exclusive opportunity to ask questions of some of our upcoming guests. All patrons have the option to have a personalized thank you sent directly to them. Also, any month that pledges cover our monthly production costs will create a special bonus episode, especially for our patrons. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The January bonus is on its way. It's coming this Tuesday. Yes. Which just happens to be the release day of The Hockey Player's Heart. Oh, nice (laughs) tie-in. Smooth. I slipped right on in there. Okay, so you can get more details on how to join Patreon with us. All you have to do is go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash biggayfictionpodcast. In the hockey player's heart, the feel-good gay romance by Jeff Adams and Will Knaus, hockey star Caleb Carter returns to his hometown to recover from an injury. He never expects to run into his one-time crush at a grade school fundraiser. Seeing Aaron Price hits him hard, like being checked into the boards. The attraction is still there, even after all these years, and Caleb decides to make a play for the school teacher. You miss 100% of the shots you never take, right? Aaron has been burned by love before, and can't imagine what a celebrity like Caleb could possibly see in a guy like him. Their differences are just too great. But as Aaron spends more time with Caleb, he begins to wonder if he might have what it takes to win the hockey player's heart. Get the hockey player's heart at dreamspinnerpress.com, amazon.com, and other online book retailers. So we've got Christina from Christina's Bookshelf back this week. She's got some book recommendations to help you get through this winter month. I'm very happy to welcome back Christina from Christina's Bookshelf to the podcast. Hello, Christina. Hello, Jeff. Happy New Year. 
Happy New Year to you, too. I hear you've got some some good books to share with us this time out. I do. I have two um, contemporary romances, one I've already reviewed and one that I will be reading. They've been out for a little while, but uh, this is going to be airing on my sister's birthday, so I'm kind of dedicating the first two to her. The second one I'm dedicating just to whomever because it's kind of a mind trip of a book and I love them. So that's what I have for you. Very cool. Well, let's, let's start off and get your sister's dedication in there. Happy birthday, Christina's sister. Yes. Happy birthday, Emily. She would be, how old am I? 35. So she would be 35 on January 15th. So happy birthday. Um, I will be eating lots of Taco Bell that day. Getting my fat on. <laughs> but that's yummy, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it is, and it's so bad for you. But, oh, well, it's her birthday. It's worth it. So I am bringing you the first two books in the Healing Heart series by Nikki James. No Regrets I have read, and it is reviewed and on my channel. So if you wanted to go check it out. No Regrets is a book about living life to its fullest. We have Landon, who was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, and he's kind of um, on a world tour doing his bucket list. His grandmother gave him a credit card and said, go do whatever it is you want to do with the rest of your life. And that's what he's doing. When he's kind of accosted by this stranger in China by the name of Abel, and Abel is this over-the-top, just living life, enjoying everything. And he just wants to be friends with Landon. But Landon has given up on friends and relationships because who wants to be with the dying guy? Oh. I know. It's so sad. But Abel just kind of, like, keeps pushing his way in there until Landon has really no choice but to become his friend. And then they keep developing until they become a little bit more. And then Abel finds out that he has this terminal disease. And it, we kind of see him spiral out of control a little bit until his brother kind of puts things in perspective for him. And so Abel rushes back to land and kind of sweeps him off his feet and for the time being, it's a happy for now. And I love this story because Landon has given up on being with anybody, with having friends, having any relationship, really human contact, period, except for with his grandma and his doctors. Because he just doesn't want to put that vibe out there. He doesn't want the pity. He just doesn't want it. And then here's Abel that's like life while well, Landon is carrying around death. And so it's really the perfect couple. And this book made me laugh and cry. And I thought for the longest time it was a standalone. And I think it was free or for 99 cents here recently and I was promoting it and somebody was like, oh my gosh, have you read the second one? And I was like, say what? <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> like, yeah. And there's four books in the series and all four are out. And so uh, New Beginnings is the second one. And this one I know is going to completely destroy my heart. Because we have Abel, who is now dealing with grief, with losing the love of his life. And everything in his life is just crashing immensely out of control. His grades, his work, his life is just beyond repair for him. He can't stabilize anything. So he starts to self-destruct, which we saw a little bit in No Regrets, but it's from what I'm gathering, it's nothing like what we're going to see in New Beginnings. And there's a trigger warning with this book about self-harm, um, abuse. I think there was a couple others. I didn't write them down. I apologize. But, I mean, Abel really goes from being 
from symbolizing life to symbolizing to symbolizing death. He's kind of taking on Landon's role. And so he starts to seek out a support group and he starts to find help from an unlikely source. And I'm really curious to know what this unlikely source is and who he finds the most help from and how he goes from the self-destruction back to the able that we've known and love from no regrets. And I think that, um, I think it's going to be rough knowing and seeing how much Abel loved Landon and Landon finally let go of things and loved Abel in return to seeing Abel in the second one. I'm going to hopefully have it read and reviewed by the time this airs, <laughs> but we're going to uh, see if I can emotionally get it done. Okay. We'll definitely look up people to the, to the, your review of the first book. And, uh, and of course, to the series, so they can go pick this up and check it out. And if you get the second one out, we'll link to that, too. Yes, I hope I will, because I think it's going to be, like I said, I think it's going to crush me, but I also think it's going to be outstanding. Nikki James has yet to let me down on anything that she has written. She does such good research on everything that she puts out there, and I just think that this is going to be one of those that really... Um, stimulates your brain, your heart, your soul, and it kind of like all melts into this puddle of goo. And then she does this wonderful job of putting you back together even stronger than you were before going into it. So I kind of look forward to being like crushed and bleh, but then being put together as a stronger human being before I went in. So it's contemporary romance with... Um, I think strong content is what I will call it. Mm -hmm. I've been reading some of those myself lately and I've, I've really gotten into like just being slapped around a little bit with my romance thrown in. Yeah. Yeah. Like this is not going to be light and fluffy. And if you're wanting something with more depth, especially after Christmas, we all got into the whole lifetime hallmarky, very fluffy romance and everything. So if you're still wanting to stick with the romance, but you're wanting something with more angst, more darkness to it, I think these would be some really good books uh, that I would recommend for a reader. So <laughs> if you're wanting to get out of the Christmas spirit altogether and not want any romance and totally be like, have your mind flipped a few times, then my last book is Skin by Christian Baines. I was a naughty reviewer and looked up other reviews on Goodreads. <laughs> and when I was making my notes, because I will have my review out later this week for this, um, I'm kind of astounded by the amount of people that gave it three to two stars by um, saying that it was something that wasn't their cup of tea, but they picked it up anyways not expecting what they got. So I guess here's what I want to say. If you have never read a Christian Baines book, I would not recommend Skin being the first thing you read. If you haven't read anything and you're looking for like a mind trip, I would suggest Puppet Boy. If you can handle Puppet Boy, then read Skin. If Puppet Boy is something that is not to your liking, then you're probably not going to like Skin either. Skin takes us to New Orleans, where we have kind of four characters. We have Mark, Kyle, Ash, and the Paranormal. This is an urban fantasy. It's not, and I cannot repeat this enough, not romance by any means. There's sex for the purpose of sex in this book. There's murder. There's revenge. Um, as I said, there's just plain, dirty, stinky sex. There's foul language. There's um, 
horrible words that are used. I mean, it's life. It's dirty and grangy and crusty, and it's such fantastic literature. It's not, you know, Harlequin. It's, I just, I can't express, I guess, enough that it's not your everyday typical MM story that you get on Amazon and you go and look for that it's going to like set you in a certain mood. This is going to play with your mind. I knew almost from the beginning exactly how part of it was. I had no idea how we got there. And riding the ride or getting on the train and getting us to the point of how I got to my conclusion, holy crap. I was blown away. How Christian writes is in essence a like a dark poetic I just I'm, I'm so in awe of how he brings us this because it it is dirty but it's magnificent it's raw in its human form but it's genius and brilliant and fantastic and these characters like Ash is a horrible human being, absolutely despicable. And yet you kind of can relate, like your dark side can kind of relate to his dark side. And then you kind of feel like, oh, that's not cool. (laughs) (laughs) But then you also relate to Kyle and you can relate to Mark. And the real big thing I can say about it is that it's humanity in its rawest forms. And I loved it. I loved everything about it. You really have to step outside your box. You really can't go into it looking for romance. There is no happy ever after. There's no happy. (laughs) It's just humanity, raw, simple, but lovely and I don't know I can't there's not a word that I can find that I can settle on that simply says and describes how I feel about this book completely which in a, in one way that like, makes me sad that I can't just say this word and everybody goes oh I know what you mean but at the same time I'm kind of happy to be somewhat speechless in a sense on how I found this book Mm-hmm. That makes sense. I, I get that way with some some of them too. It's like I just don't have all the words to like say how awesome this thing was because awesome doesn't right. cover I it. Pull up the source and be like, it was fantastic, magnificent, <laughs> lovely, beautiful, raw, blah 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 blah. But like, there's not one that I'm like, I want this word to flash and sparkle and shine so everybody understands. But there isn't just one. The only thing I can give you that really gets it is that it's beautiful and raw and dirty, but at the same time, it is fan freaking tastic. And I just, I, yeah. Awesome. So that's, that's one of the best recommendations you can get is just that like being left, left speechless. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I, it's what brought me into the new year is this book. And then I went to bed and had, some of the freakiest dreams I've ever had in my life. And I woke up the next day and I looked at my husband and I was like, don't let me take a nap today because I do not want to repeat that. And he was just like, okay. Okay, so along with the trigger warnings, come a warning about what it will do to your dreams. Right, like don't read right before you go to bed. I understand. Duly noted. I can't recommend this enough. You just have to step outside your comfort zone and acknowledge that it's not a romance and you're it's you're going to be um, reading something quite different from the norm of MM reading. Cool. All right. Well, Christina, thank you so much for coming in and giving us a couple of great things to be looking at in this new year. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Did you know that podcasts love to get reviews too? Taking a moment to leave a review about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast helps us with the show's visibility online. 
please take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a review. Your comments help other readers of gay romance discover this show. Thanks for helping us spread the word about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. So earlier this week, I had the opportunity to talk with Heidi Cullen and, and Iggy Toma about their collaboration on the Roosevelt books, and actually all of Heidi's books. Uh, Iggy's been the voice for all 15 of them so far. Um, they weren't actually scheduled to be on this week, but the the interview is so good and went so long, we're splitting it into two episodes. So we're going to kick it off this week, and they're actually going to talk about a little in-depth on the Roosevelt series and how they got together on that and what Heidi's inspiration was for those books. I'm very excited to welcome Heidi Cullen and, and Iggy Toma to the podcast. Heidi has always enjoyed a good love story, provided it had a happy ending. Proud to be from the first Midwestern state with full marriage equality, Heidi is a vocal advocate for LGBT rights. She writes positive outcome romances for LGBT characters stuck against insurmountable odds because she believes there's no such thing as too much happily ever after. Amen. Uh, Iggy is a voiceover artist, musician, and activist based in New York City. He's an avid reader of romance and mystery, and he has a soft spot for daytime soap operas. Among the authors he's voiced books for, besides Heidi, are Anna Zabo, Marie Sexton Piper Vaughn, Mia Kirik, and others. Welcome, Heidi and Iggy. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks so much. So the, the, the prompt for this interview actually came from a couple of our patrons when we asked who we should have on the show in 2018. And you two actually came up a couple of times because of the Roosevelt series, uh, which is Carry the Ocean and Shelter the Sea. And podcast listeners certainly know that I have fallen hard for those books over the past couple of weeks. Uh, Heidi, let's start with you and the inspiration behind the Roosevelt series. Oh, gosh. Um, so Carry the Ocean kind of started uh, on a really it just sort of started in a weird little germ. Um, we were watching a show that I can't even remember the name of at the moment. Um, my husband would know if he were in here because I, I forget little details like that, but he remembers all of them. Um, but um, there was a show that had a side character. It was something very sci-fi, like they had weird powers, and I forget what the autistic character's powers were. Um, but the show was pretty fairly decent, but... Um, I was I was I was very interested in the autistic character. It reminded it sort of reminded me of when I was um, in my twenties. I did a lot of work with um, first um, elderly people with mental and mental and physical disabilities, and that included um, autistic people and uh, people with autism, and they and people with Down syndrome, and then a few years later, I worked with teens with that same exact same population. And um, it always stuck with me because I, the, the, the incredible contrast beyond age um, that I remembered at that time was the way that like, you could tell because of the generations, like how those individuals had grown up like obviously the, the the teens were still teens but um the people that i were were within the it was like a county home kind of situation most of those individuals had never um very few of them had ever lived in the, with their families they had always been in institutions and so the way they interacted even with like they viewed staff as family, but transient family and they had rarely any family come visit them. And they, they had a real different sense of like what they were owed as even humans. And they, and they, their sense of being human was really different and what they their rights were as humans. And then the kids, because there was a different time and different era they were mainstreamed into schools. They all lived at home. The our very idea that anybody would send them away since it, simply because they had disabilities um, was like, I mean, that would be like horrific. And so they were just vastly different. And that so that always had rung with me. And and then this watching the show like like stirred all that up in my head. And so the show like ended really abruptly and like we didn't even finish the last few episodes because we heard that the ending was unsatisfying. And so 
we should have wandered off, but that character kept ringing in my head. And it wasn't even like the best character because, of course, the actor wasn't autistic. So this was like somebody's perception, but it just kept ringing in my head. And it made me think of all that stuff in the past. And there were a couple, there were a couple of the both teens and the um, older adults that had really like, like been people that I really connected with. And I was like, God, I wonder where they are. And and then that just sort of turned into there was one day it's sort of in the same way that like Ro Davis from Nora Ranch like just I was washing dishes at the sink one day and Ro Davis started talking to me um just Emmett Washington just sort of appeared in my head and it's like the first person ones are always the worst because they just start like saying this they're like, like blah 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 and so Emmett Washington started talking to me and I would walk around and I think oh that would be an inter- interesting story but I was like God, I don't even know I tell that story and and so, but the Emmett Washington would just, and I, I started, as soon as I named him, I'm like, oh, I know I'm in trouble because now he's got a name. And, um, and so, but I wasn't sure I'd tell it. So I kept, it wasn't so much that I was scared, but I was just like hesitant because I was like, well, I, I just don't know. But it kept coming back. And then there was one time where I was like, I wasn't sure what I was going to write. And I kind of sat there going, well, what story should I write right now? Which one should I focus on? And it was just like in the back of my head, it was like Emmett in full force stood up and went, Ooh, and like, and it just like in full Emmett mode. And I was like, Emmett, did you want your story? And it was like, yes. And I was like, okay, well, I'll give this a try. And it just like barreled out. I don't remember when I exactly started writing it, but I remember it just came out. But I was like, still, I was like, who is going to take the story? I was like, I was sure Sam Hain wouldn't. And in hindsight, I probably should have, um, I probably should have like, given it to like a proper agent and send it sent it out and said somebody take this because i mean i have had like i've had like big t- i had like foreign like a, a, i had a british publisher come to me and they wanted me to take out the sex which i was like no like they wanted the rights to they wanted to republish it like there separately and they wanted to like mainstream like full-on publish it but they they wanted the sex taken out and i was like Whoa, uh, no thank you um, but, um, uh, but it, cause it always has had this weird resonance, but mean, when I wrote it, I was like, I don't even know who's going to let me publish this. And so I was mostly just like, I'm just going to write this book. So I wrote it thinking I'll never get this published. I'll never get this published. I just wrote it. And I, I didn't think anything about it. I just wrote it going, well, this might just sit on my desk. And so, so I had no I never thought about, I mean, I wanted sequels, but I never knew if they'd happen. I didn't even know. I just, I just sort of wrote it. I didn't have any big thoughts about it. I just, I just put it down and I didn't, that was how I got started. It just got started with this very strange wild hair. And I, it started with Emmett and then I was like, well, who is he with? And it, it's, it began around Emmett and then Jeremy grew like up against him because I, my thought was, well, I don't want because I I knew exactly who Emmett was in my head. I knew he was strong, and I knew he was amazing. But I also knew that just by his existing on the planet, people would have ideas of who he was and who he wasn't, and they'd take one look at him and make judgments. And I thought, okay, I want to put somebody with him that's like the polar opposite, so that they look at that person and think, oh, they're perfect and everything's fine, and that inside it's a mess and I'm like I like that contrast and that was where I started and I had ideas of where that was going to go and I had this whole other trajectory see my plans and then they got together and it went I'm like oh now we're going somewhere different and so I just went okay well I'll just follow you instead and then we ended up what we ended up with and then David showed up I didn't even know David was going to show up and he was sort of the Randy Jansen of the story there's always a Randy Jansen I was like oh look it's Randy (laughs) fucking everything up and so, oh, can I swear? Swearing, okay? Absolutely. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so, and so it, it, it just sort of like, but it was good. It was like, okay, here you are to mess everything up and probably save the day. So, yes, and it was good. And then we had Blues Brothers and everything. So, yeah, so that's how, that's how that happened. And then, and then I didn't know what to do with the book, too. And it was supposed to be David. And then it ended up being, I tried to write a short story for my patrons which ended up being Shelter of the Sea. And so, and so that's how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's how angry we are. Then I got angry at the election and then, and what I was doing with mental health. And so I just, I, yeah, 
I guess these books are just me going, I don't know, I'll just write this, which isn't a weird strategy, but I guess that's mine. At what point in the process do you go from telling their story that they've mm -hmm. got as characters and then doing what must be a ton of research to layer in all the stuff that makes Emmett Emmett and Jeremy Jeremy and all of the assorted political things around having a place like the Roosevelt house and what was going on in Iowa. Um, I do it all at the same time. Um, like the, like the Iowa, like especially speaking of shelter, the sea, like the political stuff of Iowa, I knew, like, I mean, I've known that Iowa is like going, I mean, we're, we're, we're just like, the thing is, is that like, since while I wrote the book, I had to keep editing because I mean, just from knowing, uh, watching, I mean, just even reading like Twitter headlines, like Iowa kept going, kept, kept having, uh, kept having er erosion in its mental health care and coverage. And it had to do a lot with the way, because we privatized Medicaid. And so if you are on, um, and then we have closed almost every bed, like the biggest thing is like in 1950, um, Iowa had... Like, I wrote them in, uh, like, a blog tour I did, but it was, like, something like 1,500 beds. Like, so if you if you went into a hospital or anywhere and said, look, I'm, I'm having trouble, I need, you know, I'm feeling, like, I'm feeling like having trouble, like, I thought it's like I might kill myself, or I just, I'm not feeling okay, or you took your loved one in and said, look, these, this person needs needs special care, we need, they need to be admitted to the hospital for mental health reasons, there were 1,500 beds, and the, po the population was was less. I mean, Iowa has actually bled a lot of population for a lot of it's because it, it's doing really backwards growth things right now, but it's still a lot bigger than it was in 1950. But we have, I, I forget what the thing is. I think it's like, I want to say it's like 350 beds. I mean, it's like a really stupid number. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like we have like, I think double the population or like at least 75% more population, but we have more than half, less than half the beds that we had then. So, and, and it is not uncommon. Like if you go, like if you went in my town and you went into the hospital and said, I'm feeling suicidal, it's not, it's completely conceivable that you would sit in the ER for more than a day, just sitting in the waiting room, waiting for a bed, saying, I'm wow. feeling like I'm going to kill myself. You would just sit there because there's just nowhere to go. And, and that's like, that's with insurance. And so like, if, but if you have Medicaid or whatever, you might have to drive over an hour because they keep, they so made it all privatized. And so if you have, and most people, most people, I mean, the Roosevelt is impossible. It's not, it's, it wouldn't exist. That's the thing is like people, some people will write me at the who like know more about the way these populations would be channeled and everything. It's like, this is completely impossible. I go, I know I wrote it because I wish it, I wish it could. But I mean, anywhere that would exist like that, first of all, would be crazy expensive. You'd have to have like mad money to both fund it and to live there. But even if you did, you would probably be on some sort of like fun public funding. And in Iowa, it would be it would be you would then be on one of these, um, except for Emmett, who had a job, which is really unique. He, you would um, you would have to be on this public funding, and so you would in Iowa, you would want to be one of previously three now i think two maybe one private companies who bought medicaid and you these are just your choices and so they'll say to you you have to get your health care you have to drive to des moines i mean i would just imagine that you're that you're you know one of these residents of the roosevelt and you have to get to des moines for one of your health care visits so these people have to ferry you down because you can't drive and des moines from from ames is 40 40 minutes and then you have to go to one of these places where you sit and when we were when we were foster parents we had to take some you know we had to go down there and it was you sat for sometimes an hour just waiting to go in for like a five minute appointment and the the you didn't get great care and it and so you and you had to fight to get what you want and we knew what we were fighting for and we knew what to ask. But if you don't know, if, especially if you, if you're tired and you don't know what you're asking for. And you know, if you're just an aide and you're like, I don't, you know, if you're just there to like ferry, nobody's going to ask, you're just going to collect and go. And so 
everything, all that spirals onto everything. And so I knew all that. So that's what, like, part of what I wanted to put in the book. I wanted to put some of that frustration, but I couldn't. I was always like pulling back. I'm like, I knew all this stuff. And so I was like, how do I put that without like putting it in there? And so I tried to like contain it to something that you could track and feel the frustration with without like make and without like bogging it down in so much that you would just be like, okay, Heidi just got way too technical. And I knew I would probably get too technical for some people, but I was trying to make it so that it was basically just this emotional football that you could track, get invested in, get your heart broken with, and then go, what they're, you know, and, but there's hope and, you know, and you can Im- impress anything on it. You can say that's politics in general. That's, you know, you know, whatever it is that you want to put your thing in. I was, I wanted to make it about like that. I, I mean, I knew they had to fail. I knew they had to not make it through, but Spoiler I wanted to alert. <laughs> Sorry, should I not do that? No, that's fine. <laughs> I assumed people had read the book. Um, but, um, I wanted to make it that they could, um, that they could, um, that, because it was not about, it was about finding, like, it had to be about finding their strength despite adversity. Because mm-hmm. Carry the Ocean was all about, you know, not only about winning so much as about, like, celebration of, you know, you're awesome. And this, I wanted to be about, like, book two was more like, okay, let's be in the world and have it be shitty at you which is real and then go you can be awesome despite the shit and i mean you don't have to i mean you don't have to have a disability to need that message but you know how great to go well i feel like i have all this shit in my way but i can if emmett can do it i can do it and yeah and i it just added to the reality i mean you know nobody thought we'd be in the political spot we're in now and that happened and so yeah. while I was sad they didn't win, I'm like, mm, yeah, that's the way the world works right there. Yeah. Um, let's hear from Iggy a little bit. Um, these books are different than what you've done for Heidi to date, as far as I can tell. Um, what was it like seeing this manuscript and finding these voices to, to bring all this into a reality? Yeah, I was thrilled when I first read it. I mean, I think I, I've always loved Heidi's work, and uh, but when I read these books, I was like, "Wow, these are these are pretty special." And and Heidi had kind of warned me. She said these are very special and very important to me. Um, so I knew how uh, how that they needed to be treated with care and um, and as much integrity as possible. Uh, but I think ultimately the task is the same. It's I, I kind of mine the text for any hints that that Heidi gives me about how these characters sound. Um, and you know, Emmett was a very a very unique case uh, for how to make a voice that felt um, real and specific and something that uh, captured not only um, that he's a person with, with autism, but also just his tenacious, you know, inner self. Uh, he's such a dynamic character that, that all of that had to come through in a way that, um, you know, was, I could still kind of keep the narrative flowing and, and, uh, have a good rhythm. Uh, but you know, so I, I found a little, uh, when I'm creating a voice, I have to find, um, what Heidi kind of shines a light on. And then I have to go from there and kind of make my own choices. But in the text, uh, Jeremy describes Emmett as he sounded slightly robotic, all his words stuffed together in a string, all the vocal inflections put in the wrong places. So there's those little hints in there. Um, and then I thought about uh, if I knew anybody that reminded me of Emmett, and there's a, uh, a guy in my life who I think is kind of uh, very, he's a person with autism, but also has that endless... He endlessly tenacious and uh, and in no way hides who he is and is upfront who he is. So I used him as kind of inspiration. I remember I sent uh, he had done a, a video for a uh, college class and I sent it to Heidi and she was like, "Yes, that's perfect." So um, he was kind of my inspiration for Emmett. Uh, but yeah, so the, I think that that these books added. Um, a bit of challenge, but in a way that was, that was, uh, that much more thrilling. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Darren a little bit because 
here's an interesting character from the way I was looking at it in that he doesn't speak for himself. He has the signing that he does and also the iPad that speaks for him on occasion. And yet you built, you built a voice for him. Yeah, no, that, I, that's fun. Funny that you brought that up. Cause that was, that was a, a unique challenge. Um, there are times designated in the text where it's a computerized robotic voice voice. So I took a, a stab at that. Um, but I, 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 I thought that it would be, you know, that I needed to uh, give him a, a voice beyond that. That was um, kind of the essence of him. Um, Cause he is uh, a very bright human being and he does communicate uh with his friends, um, just like anybody does, but with a slightly different way. So I wanted to give him a voice um, that kind of uh, hit it who he is as a person. Um, he's kind of, I think he's just kind of a, a really sweet love muffin. So I kind of, kind of gave him a warm, slightly uh, like, a, just like a, a, the voice of someone who, who is super uh, empathetic and caring, because I think he is as a person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that that really comes off even even in his robotic voice. I think the way you set it up is because I think I can't remember the, how it works out anymore because it all it all runs as one story. But I think we had him signing before we ever heard his computer voice, and those two there's a connection between those two um, that was to me as the reader was so perfect. Good. What was your collaboration on these books? Because I, I, having talked to voice artists in the past, it's been when we we get the stuff, we, we talk a little bit to the writer about it, then we go off and record it. Because of these books, was there more collaboration than, than usual or different than what you two had done in the past? Um, uh, uh, probably about the same, a little bit more, I guess. Um, I, as I said, I, 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 when I was wrestling with how to voice Emmett, I uh, sent Heidi that video of, of my friend. Um, so that was kind of an initial step in to be like, to just to make sure we were on the same page. You know, it, it's a book that demands, uh, I think, a bold choice. Um, but that's a little intimidating as an interpretive artist like myself. You know, I don't want to... Um, go way off from what from the voice in, in Heidi's head. Uh, so I, I touched base to make sure that I was uh, in, in the right right realm. Um, and yeah, Heidi gave me the green light. Yeah, I don't I haven't never had I've never had Iggy say, usually he's asked me questions about books, but I've never I don't think I've ever gone. No, no, no. Usually I go, yeah, that sounds really good. Like he asked about he asked about Darren too, and I had lots of times he'll ask things and go, oh yeah, sorry, I didn't think of it. <laughs> I didn't think of it. I didn't realize that would be a problem. Sorry. Yeah. But as you as you wrote Shelter, did you did did Iggy's voices just populate your head all the more now that you knew exactly what these characters sounded yeah. like? Yeah, that's always fun. Once once he's voiced the book and there's a sequel, then it's like. Then, then they just are there in my head, and then, like, um, like not like like the Love Lessons books. Now I know how they all sound. <laughs> but, like there was a there was a small um, there was a small riot on my Patreon because um, I had said I had asked him. I said, so the next Love Lessons book is going to be the the girls, and I had said to Iggy, I said, I want will you voice it, even though it's the girls. He said, well, look, I can get you some some girl some I can get you some female voice actors and I said I don't know I don't think people will like it if you don't voice it and I asked my patrons I said so what do you think Should and they were like no he must read it and I said you know this is the whole thing and people were like you've got to read it you know there's gonna be blood so oh yeah so well that'll be another fun challenge I look forward yeah. to it speaking of of female voices and a little bit more of spoilerly, spoilerly eh, territory. Um, you have to voice a certain uh, popular female talk show host in Shelter. <laughs> what was that daunting to 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 voice someone who is real? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it adds a little bit uh, of, of, of added pressure because especially someone so iconic. Uh, so I, of course, I immediately got on YouTube and, and did my uh, what makes her voice her voice and, and different speech patterns and inflections. Um, just to, so that, you know, I... I I, I don't ex I, I never expect that I'm going to transform and suddenly sound exactly like that person. Hopefully the, the listeners don't expect that either. But I just want the the essence of them to come through uh, to just give the a give her a, a, to make the scene more full and more dynamic. Um, but yeah, so there was many a YouTube video to try to to try to figure <laughs> out how to pull that off. <laughs> and it was essence because I mean you're not like, you know, an impersonator, you know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, for me, it worked. It's like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> she has very specific rhythms, so that helped. Mm -hmm. So the big question, Heidi, is are there more Roosevelt books? You've talked about, you know, maybe finding David's story in there and things like yeah. that while we've while we've been talking. Um, yeah, no, there, there will be more. I always meant... My original thought that there was that there were going to be three, and it was going to be Emmett and then David, and then I didn't know who the third one was going to be, but I thought I'd figure it out. And now I'm really confused because I, I'm. It really bugs me that there's two Emmett and Jeremy ones that I'm like that really makes my skin crawl. I'm like there should be three because I don't like two, and so but I don't know what the third one would be, and I'm like, well then I'm like, well should I write the third one next? Or should I write another one and come back? And I have so much on my plate right now that I'm like, I have so many other books that have been like waiting because of the small trash fire that was Sam Main closing. And so right now I, I'm that's I'm like that's where I'm at. I'm like, well, what is next? And so, but there were always because it was going to be David's story and then the other but now i'm like well is there going to be another emmett story and emmett and jeremy story or is there going to be is it going to be the david story next and then does, because there's three if there's three emmett stories does that mean there's three david stories and i'm like i don't know and so now i gotta figure out how many stories there are where they are and what's going on my daughter wants there to be a million because she really likes the series she calls them her cinnamon rolls and so um <laughs> So she would like a million of these, and so I, 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 I don't know that I can do a million, but, um, but yeah, there's definitely more. I just have to figure out how many and how it works out. But they take me a while to write because uh, it's it's not even just research; it's just thinking and making sure I do it properly and what. Because I feel like there, I mean, there are romances, but I feel like there's so much other stuff going on in the background that I have to make sure that that goes properly and. And so I had to think about how I want to do it. And I would prefer to write these books. Like, I feel like all my books lately have been written like on while I'm on fire. And so I would, my new goal is I, I would like to get to where I'm not writing books while I'm on fire. And I would really like to write these books like with care and grace and, and, you know, have fun with them and, you know, and so that's where I want to get to, but I'm definitely not to that stage yet. I'm, I'm trying to write three books by the end of March and I'm near the end of the first one. So, yeah. And then I have to hurry and write another one. So yeah. I love that's that you're not media right now. I'm, I'm... <laughs> I love that your daughter read these books. Did she yeah. read all of your books or was it these in no. particular? No, she is. She is. Um, she is. She, I told her she could read whatever she wanted, but I, I explained to her what is in um, some of them, and then she goes, yeah, I'll pass. Um, she likes the, um, she listened to Antisocial on the Way Down to Texas when we were going to an anime convention. She was going to re do something else, and then I was listening to it because I hadn't had a chance to listen to it yet. And um, and she and her friend like stopped what they were doing, and they got so into it, because the, and they really liked Iggy's voice. And, um, that but and they like that one um but she likes the love lessons books and she likes to like to carry the ocean but those are the only ones she's done she's about to start fever pitch but um she has not she's about as far as she might do dance with me but she doesn't go she's, she's she will not do anything racy at all so that you know that sort of like exits out a whole 
a whole bunch of the catalog right there. She might later, but she says that's weird when, you know, like the parts in Love Lesson, she said, Mom, this is weird to read. And I go, yeah, you should not read a whole bunch of my stuff. I said, special <laughs> delivery is definitely out. Um, never read Nowhere Ranch. She's like, that's just weird that you wrote that, Mom. And I go, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> no. But, uh, yeah, she she reads some of it, but yeah. Well, she Carry picked the movement with these right. for sure. <laughs> so it was really exciting to talk to them and to find out the origins of Emmett because, as everybody knows, over the past few weeks, I have fallen so hard for the mm -hmm. Roosevelt books. Now, I talked with Heidi a little bit after the interview. She made reference to a sci fi show and she couldn't quite pull out the name of it. The show was Alphas and it ran on sci fi uh, back around 2011, 2012 for a couple of seasons. Uh, she's provided a couple of clips to us. Um, one of them shows the character Gary, who Emmett, who kind of sparked the idea for Emmett, uh, trying to get permission to drive a car. Uh, it's a good clip. Plus, she gave us a whole episode that's available on YouTube that really delves into Gary's character. So the links for both of those are in the show notes. Next week, we'll have Heidi and Iggy back. We'll talk more about their latest audio, Antisocial, which came out last year as well as finding out more about their collaboration and what they've got coming up later this year for both of them. Cool. Yeah. That'll be fun. Absolutely. So I think that'll do it for this week. Yes. But remember, guys, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until then, everyone keep reading. For detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.